Trajectories of Dynamical Systems. When we began this lesson, we used a predator-prey example involving coyotes and roadrunners. We ended that example with a phase portrait uh, that helped us understand the trajectories based on various initial state vectors. And so let's explore that some more and begin by trying to understand how these trajectories work. Example seven. Suppose A equals the 2 by 2 matrix 0 0.8, 0, 0, 0.64, and x naught, the initial state vector, is equal to 100, 100. That'd be 100 roadrunners, sorry, 100 coyotes and 100 roadrunners. And let's find and plot x of 1, x of 2, x of 3, et cetera, et cetera, all the way to x of 10, where x of 1 would be the state of the uh, dynamical system after one year, x2 would be the state of the dynamical system after two years, x3 would be the state of the dynamical system after three years. Our first step is to find each of these values. So to find x1, uh, we would start with x0, which we know is 100, 100. So to find x1, we would take our A matrix, which is 0 0.8, 0, 0, 0.64. Notice that that's a, a diagonal matrix. And multiply by 100, 100. And we will get 80 and 64. We could call this x1, or we could also call it x of 1. Whichever notation uh, is preferable, we'll sometimes go back and forth between the two notations. So notice this would be like a times x naught. So then to find x2, we would have our a times our x1. So if you take the same matrix a and now you multiply it by 80 times 64, those a times 80, 64, you will get uh, 64 and then 40.96. And then to find x3, we would take our a and multiply it by x2. We'll have a times x2. And this uh, you could call uh, also call x of 3, and it would be 52.2. 26.2, 21.2, Again, this we could also call this x of three. And continuing on in each manner, notice that we're multiplying by a each time. And so, for example, x10 or x of 10 would be a to the 10 times x naught, or you can think about it as a times x sub nine. And all of these, uh, when you run all the calculations, would leave you with uh, 10.7, 1.2. Again, we could call this x sub 10, or we could call it x of 10, whichever notation you prefer. So I crunched these values earlier. And according to my calculations, if we have uh, t and we have x of t, let's see. So when t is 0, x of t is 100, 100. t is 1, we get 80, 64. T is 2, we get 64, 40.96. When T is 3, we get 51.2 times 26.2. 4, 4, we'll get 40.96, familiar number, and 16.8. Five, 
we'll get 32.8. Each time we're, I, I've crunched these numbers separately, but each time you would find these numbers by simply taking, you know, if I want to find the sixth value, I would take A and multiply it by my X of five that's here. Six, 26.2. And 6.9, 7, 20.8, sorry, 20.1, and 4.4, 8, 16.6, sorry, 16.8, 9, 13.4, and 10, and 0.7, and uh, 1.2. So for each t value, we have an, a state vector, x0, x1, x2, or x of 3, x of 4, x of 5, that tells us kind of the Think about it as the X, Y position or the road runners and coyotes or coyotes and road runners, depending upon how the question is set up. So the question asked us to find the state in all those places, this we've done, and then it asked us to, to graph this. So to graph this, we have our X1 axis. Notice this X1 is the uh, first component of the x vector, not the state after one year. We have the x2 axis. Again, that's the second component, not the state after the second year. It's a little bit confusing. And then we could start graphing. So maybe we could start with our 100, 100 point. We come out here to 100, 100, and we have this point when t equals zero. And then we could come in and we could ask, well, what happens when t equals one? When t equals one, we would want to be at mm, about here, I think it's 80 and uh, 64. So maybe here. So this is our t equals one point. And then we could look for our t equals 2 point, 64, 50. Here's 64 and 40. And it takes a couple of points to start seeing what's going on here. So let's see if we can get a couple more. So now let's go for 3. So it's 50. Here's 52. And 26. So you'll notice the points are getting closer together. My graphing's not perfect here. Let's see, 4 would be 40. That's 50. There's 40. And what do we need? 16. T equals four. Draft. Oh, I lost the point. Sorry. Okay. And we'll do one more for good measure. Let's see, we're back to blue. Got thirty two. Thirty-three and eleven. No, nothing like that. Which is here. I think this t equals t equals five. And I think you should be able to see a couple of different things here. So notice that our trajectory is very much going toward the origin. So there's this 
flow that's happening. And you'll notice that it's always going toward the origin. So let's see if we can see that. So trajectory is toward. And you could see or anticipate why this might be the case if you think about the original matrix A, the 0 0.8, 0, 0, 0, 0.64, is each time we multiplied by A, we were multiplying our X component by 0 0.8, it's a number less than one or between zero and one. And we we're multiplying our Y component or our X2 component by 0.64, again, a number between zero and one. Um, and so you can see the, uh, the idea of it going towards the origin. Notice also that the, the 0.8 is bigger than the 0.64. So bigger, smaller. And so if you think about a line, here's the line y equals x. So if the if these the these two red numbers down here, the 0.8, the 0.64 were the same, we'd just be going along that green y equals x line. But because the the 0.8 is bigger, we're going to be hugging the that because this one's bigger, we're going to be hugging that x2 axis. And so we'll be on the lower side of that y equals x line. You can imagine if they were flip-flopped, then our curve would go the other direction and above more towards the x2 axis than the x1 axis. So there's our first trajectory that we are going to explore in this particular video. Example seven revisited. Again, let's let A be the two by two matrix 0 0.8, 0, 0, and 0 0.64, which should clearly have eigenvalues of 0.8 and 0.64. These have corresponding eigenvectors of 1, 0, and 0, 1. Notice that we started with a diagonal matrix, so our uh, eigenvectors should be pretty easy to find. So here's the eigenvector that goes with 0.8. Here's the eigenvector that goes with 0.64. So if we started with some x naught, some initial state vector that was c1, c2, then you could think about that c1, c2 here as being c1 times v1 uh, plus c2 times v2. Remember that our v1 is just the uh, standard basis vector 1, 0, and our v2 is just the standard basis vector 0, 1. So then our xk, remember A is a diagonal matrix, our xk would be c1 times 0.8 to the k times 1, 0, plus c2 times 0.64 to the k times 0, 1. I'm hoping everybody's seeing what's going on here. So here's my yellow stuff. Here's my blue stuff. And what's changed is now we're saying the kth uh, state of the the kth state can be found by taking that the the yellow eigenvalue and raising it to the kth power and the blue eigenvalue and raising it to the uh, kth power as well so that k is is playing a really dominant part and like we talked about before when k gets large 0.8 goes to 0 0.64 goes to 0 so graphically what this means is that if we start in some position like 100, 100, or in this case, we're starting with 3, 3, just like we saw below earlier. Here's my line, y equals x. We can see that our trajectory is gonna to go towards the origin, but it's going to be it's toward the origin, but it's gonna be underneath the line y equals x because we have that uh, greater eigenvalue in the x1 direction. If we started here at like 1.5 and 3, we would again go toward the origin because you could think about drawing a line from the initial point straight to the 
origin or will be on the x1 side again because of the x1 eigenvalue being bigger if we happen to start if we happen to start right along the x2 axis we would go straight to the origin if we started along the x1 axis we would go straight to the origin etc cetera, etc cetera. i think you're starting to see the picture Regardless of where we start, we're going straight, straight towards the origin. And if if we take a draw a line from that initial starting point, you drew a line from the initial starting point to the origin, you'll notice that your actual trajectory is going to be on the side that's favored, uh, kind of like with that has the bigger the bigger eigenvalue. Bigger eigenvalues are more dominant. That's what's going to win in the tug of war, if you will, between the two possible trajectories. So just to make sure that you're understanding what's going on here, we started with the eigenvalues of lambda equals 0.8 and lambda equals 0.64. Both of these are lambdas between 0 and 1. And so we end up with the origin being an attractor, right? Everything is being sucked into the origin. It's like a black hole. So everything is being sucked in. Example eight. Suppose A is 1.44, 0, 0, and 1.2. What are the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors? So let's start by finding those eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues, we can read straight off the diagonal. They would be lambda equals 1.44 and lambda equals 1.2 and those are going to have corresponding eigenvalues sorry eigenvectors of uh, v1 equal to 1 0 uh, and v2 equal to 0 1 the reason we know again that our eigenvectors are so nice is because we started with a diagonal matrix and so things work out really smoothly for us but what would happen here well we had some initial point uh if we have our initial point we'll notice that we're always going to make our x1 value and our x2 values bigger and so we're always going to be moving away from the origin so we're moving away we're moving away we're moving away. Notice that if we drew a line from the initial point to where we end, here, for example, uh, notice that our, all right, let's look at what this does graphically. So notice that if we have some initial starting point, uh, the trajectories are always going to take us away from the origin. Different starting point, we're always moving away from the origin uh, because both of those eigenvalues are larger. In terms of how do I know whether it's curving, like is, is it getting flatter or is it getting more steep? Uh, notice uh, that, again, think about this line like y equals x. The line y equals x here would be where you would where we would travel if the lambdas were exactly the same value but since our lambda uh, associated with x1 is bigger we're always going to be trying to curve toward that x1 axis okay so again here, here would be the line y equals negative x and so again since the lambdas the lambda of 1.44 is bigger than the 1.2 so then this one's associated with the y1, that trajectory is always going to curve toward the x1 axis. Here, notice that both of those eigenvalues are bigger than one, right? We have lambda lambdas that are bigger than one. Since we have lambdas that are bigger than one, that tells us that the origin is what we call a repeller. Like it's sending everything away from it. Example nine. 
suppose a is equal to 200.5. 0, 0, 0. Notice that here we have one lambda, which is equal to two. And one of the fancy things about two is that two is bigger than, not bigger, it is bigger than zero, but specifically it's bigger than one. And we also have lambda equal to 0. 0.5, which is uh, between plus and minus one. Sorry, I said that wrong. Between zero and one, right? So this eigenvalue of two makes us want to repel. And this eigenvalue of 0.5 makes us want to attract. So how would those two come together? So we want to be uh, we want to be attracted to the x2 axis, or we want to be attracted, maybe it's not so much to the x2 axis, it's we want to be attracted to uh, x2 equals zero, and we want to be repelled from, we want to be make, uh, repelled along the x1 axis, so that is we want our x1 to go to infinity. So the way this plays out is we start at some random point and our x2s get small as we move along, but our x1s get large. Start somewhere else, our x2s get small, our x1s go to plus or minus infinity. Something along those lines. And so here we have the origin sort of attracting and sort of repelling um, it's like a very, very fragile point. Notice that if you started on the x2 axis itself, you'd go straight towards the origin. But if you were on the x1 axis, you would roll away infinitely far. And so that origin point right there, the origin point is what we call a saddle point. The origin is a saddle point. So you're going to get a saddle point in the case where you have one eigenvalue bigger than one and the other between zero and one. So question, in the previous examples, we focused on diagonal matrices. Is this reasonable? Is it overly simplistic? Let's explain. So if there are enough eigenvectors, then a dynamical system is diagonalizable. We can think of P and P inverse as giving a change of basis to coordinates where the diagonal matrix represents the transformation. In short, it is actually reasonable to assume or to try to understand these things by just looking at diagonal matrices because all of the types of systems we're looking at are diagonalizable. Example 10 show that the origin is a saddle point for the solutions of x k plus 1 equal to a times x of k, where a is 1.25 minus 0.75 minus 0.75 and 1.25. So our first step is to find the eigenvalues. So step one and the lambdas. So to do that, we need to solve 0 equals, uh, looks like we have 5 over 4, or 1.25 minus lambda times 5 over 4 minus lambda, and then we'll subtract out 9 over 16, 3 quarters times 3 quarters, which will be lambda squared minus 5 halves lambda plus 1. We could uh, multiply both sides by 2. And so this tells us that, so this implies by multiplying by 2 that we have 0 equals 2 lambda squared minus 5 lambda plus 2, which factors 2 lambda lambda 
minus and minus. And it looks like we need to have a two and a one. So that tells us that lambda equals two or lambda equals a half. So we can already see that this is a, a saddle point situation. We just don't know the orientation of the saddle. So let's see if we can figure out our eigen or eigen vectors. So step two, that was step one. So now we'll do step two. We want to find the eigen vectors. So we can do this one at a time. So if we have lambda equals two, then we need to find a minus two i, which will be minus 0.75, well, minus 0.75, they're all negative, they're all the same. We could ask, how would we combine these vectors or these columns in order to add to zero? So if we had one of the first column and negative one of the second column, uh, we know that this would add to zero. So this tells us that we have the eigenvector, eigenvector v1 would be one and minus one. Similarly, if we had lambda equals a half, and we're going to look at a minus a half i, and that matrix will be plus 0.75 minus 0.75 minus 0.75 plus 0.75. And we could ask, how would these columns be combined to add to zero? And so it looks like if you had one of the first and minus one of the second, sorry, plus one of the second, then you would add to zero because they're same but opposite signs. And so we get that the eigenvector B2 is equal to 1, 1. So now we should be able to combine all of this information. So we know that we have our normal grid. Here's our x1. Here's our, our x2. And then we're going to graph these two, two trajectories. So we know one trajectory is along the line, uh, like the, the V2 line, vector line. So it's, this is going both directions towards infinity. We'll, uh, we know that in this case, the lambda is a half. So since our lambda is, is between zero and one, we know that we're going to be going towards the origin. And we know that our other eigenvalue is two, and it's along the line y equals negative, y equals negative x. So here's the v1 line. Again, this is the line parallel to the vector v1. And here we know that our eigenvalue is bigger than one. And so we're going to repel away from the origin. And so that allows us to figure out what our saddle point trajectories will look like. We started at some point here in the first quadrant, we would saddle our way from the blue towards towards the green, from the blue, towards the green, from the blue, towards the green. If you started a little farther away, it would be a softer move. If, it would, if you started close to the red axis, then you would stay along the red for longer and then end up right up with asymptotically next to the green. So phase portraits get more interesting when we have complex eigenvalues. So these would be eigenvalues that have a non-real part. So we could have our complex eigenvalue R, well not R, it'd be uh, lambda equal to A plus BI. And then R would be the square root of A squared plus B squared. So it's the modulus or the magnitude of that complex eigenvalue. 
And so if that modulus r equal to a plus uh, a squared, square root of a squared plus b squared, if that is less than one, so if it's a small modulus or a small eigen complex eigenvalue, then you'll notice that we could spiral our way in. So we're spiraling in towards the origin. So we're always getting closer and closer to the origin. So it's like think about a spaceship that's going to uh, eventually crash land into the planet. If we had r equal to exactly one, then we would end up going around and around and around and around in a circle. And this is what we hope that the Earth is doing around the sun, right? That it's not getting closer to the sun, not getting farther to, from the sun, but it's on a closed path. And then if you have r being bigger than one, the modulus, the modulus or the magnitude of that uh, complex eigenvalue, then we are going to move farther and farther away from the origin. So this is the one that we don't want to be the case for the Earth, right? Where we're going to spiral outward forever and things will get colder and colder and colder. So example 11, consider the dynamical system and sketch the trajectory of the k plus one state vector equal to a times x of k. So the dynamical system where a equals three, negative five, one, negative one. And the initial state is zero, one. This is gonna be a, a relatively lengthy question where we have to work through complex eigenvalues. So again, step one, Again, step one is to find the lambdas. So here we have to solve zero equals, uh, what do we have? Three minus lambda, times minus one minus lambda plus five, which works out to be Lambda squared minus two lambda plus two. This is not going to factor, so we're going to need to use our quadratic formula. So lambda is equal to negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus four is a times c all over two a, which looks like. Uh, two plus or minus square root of negative four over two. Uh, square root of negative four would be uh, two i. So this would be two plus or minus two i over two or one plus or minus i. So there's our, um, there's our, Eigenvalues, notice they're complex conjugates. Also, notice that our r would be the square root of 1 plus 1, and 1 squared plus 1 squared, or the square root of 2. So we know this is going to be a situation where we're going to spiral out, right? It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Something along those lines. All right, step two, let's find our eigenvectors. Step two. All right, so to do that, we pick a, an eigenvector. It doesn't really matter which one, but because of the way our diagonalization process works or our factorization process works in the case of complex numbers, we're going to grab the negative. So I'm going to grab lambda equals one minus i. So we have the choice, but this is the one we're gonna choose. And so now we're gonna look at a minus one minus i, imaginary i times the identity matrix, which will be two plus i minus five, one, and minus two plus i. 
And we could row reduce this by simply swapping our rows. If we swap our rows, we'll end up with one minus two plus i, two plus i minus five. Remember the way eigen values work and eigenvectors work is that we know this matrix has a non-trivial, it's gonna have a non-trivial null space. That is, we know it's gonna have, at least it's gonna have one pivot. You can see that it's gonna have a pivot because this is a non-zero vector or non-zero matrix and it's gonna have one free variable. So we know that when we ref this, that second uh, row is gonna be zero. So without even having to do any work, we know that when we ref this, we're gonna end up with one minus two plus i, zero and zero. And we could ask ourselves, what would be a good, uh, what would be a good eigenvector and so we're asking, how could these columns be combined? Well, these columns could be combined to add to zero if we had two minus i of the first uh, of the first column, and we had one of the second column. Okay. So our eigenvector is eigenvec uh, is going to be 2 minus i and 1, which we could write, knowing the, where we're headed, we could write this as 2, 1 plus i times minus 1 and 0. So a couple of oddities about this uh, that I just want to highlight. We chose to work with the negative. Uh, eigenvalue, and by choosing to work with the negative eigenvalue uh, allows us to follow our formula that we got in the previous video. You could use the positive, it just would change the way the formulas work. So it works either way, you just have to make some uh, slight revisions. Chose to work with the negative eigenvalue, and then notice that we are choosing to add the complex part. So we're this is going to be positive, and so we built our negative into the vector, not into the operation between the two vectors. So step three is to work on the factorization. And to do this, um, you might want to review example six, because it's, at least for me, um, making these videos. It's been a minute since I was back there. So review example six. All right. So let's see how this works. So we're going to say that our A is going to equal the P C P inverse, where um, C is going to be a rotation scaling matrix and P is going to be our change of coordinates. So let's see. So P is equal to uh, the change of coordinates matrix. And the P is going to come from the eigenvectors. And so uh, let's see if you can see it. So here, and let's check and change my colors. So remember, the real component of our eigenvector was 2, 1. So that's going to mean form the first column of our P matrix. And the complex part of our eigenvector was minus 1, 0. And that's going to form the second column of our P matrix. How about C? So C as you may recall, is equal to A minus B, B, A, where the lambdas, our lambda, was equal to A plus or minus B, I. In our case, that was 1 plus or minus 1, I. And so our C is going to be equal to 
one minus one, one, one. Like that, where, let's see if you're seeing what's going on. So here, my A, which is one, is going to be here. And my B, which is also one, will be here and there. And remember, the minus sign is built into the formula. Okay, this is a row, this matrix C is a, which kind of matrix? That's right, it's a rotation scaling matrix. So since we have a rotation scaling matrix and we know what the modulus is or the scaling factor is, it's the R or square root of two, we can factor out a square root of two. And so this would be equal to one over, sorry, not one over, just square root of two, that's the R that we've pulled out. And then we have a one over root two minus one over root two, one over root two, one over root two. And you might recognize this as square root of two times cosine of, of pi over four uh, minus sine of pi over four, uh, sine of pi over four, and cosine of pi over four. And so we're saying it's a rotation scaling matrix. So we're rotating uh, pi over four uh, counterclockwise, and we're gonna scale by square root of two. So just to be clear, this tells us that our A matrix is equal to P, which is two and one vertically and minus one zero horizontally. So that's my P times my C, which is square root of two times all of that other garbage. Uh, maybe I'll write it as cosine minus sine sine cosine. So I see all at pi over four. And then P inverse, which in this case is pretty easy to calculate because it's a two by two matrix. So that'll be zero, one, minus one, two. And we could check this by simply multiplying it all out if we were so inclined. So step four, we want to sketch this trajectory. Step four, sketch the trajectory. And remember, we were given an initials point. We were given x naught equal to 0, 1. This is our initial state. OK, so if that was our initial state, let's see if we can understand what's going on. So the first thing we're going to do here is we are going to try to change our x naught into the coordinate system uh, that the rotation scaling matrix works for. So we're going to find x naught, which is, again, that 0, 1, in terms of uh, the coordinate system given by our complex eigenvectors. In terms of the coordinates, maybe I'll call these the C coordinates, which would be like the real part of X and the imaginary part of X. More familiarly, 2, 1, which we already found, and the minus 1, 0. So we want to find X naught, so X naught with respect to these C coordinates. And we've got the new basis. And so we know that to our PC matrix is going to be the 2, 1, minus 1, 0. And x, uh, sorry, x 
with respect to these, with respect to C, would be PC inverse times RX naught, which we can crunch, do a little bit of basic matrix multiplication like we've done a thousand times, and we get one, two, with respect to our complex uh, coordinate system. So now we're uh, kind of in line with those complex eigenvectors. So, so the second thing we can look at here is we can ask what the rotation does. What does the rotation do? So what does that rotation do? Well, we have this rotation matrix where we're starting with cosine minus sine, sine, cosine. And these are all at pi over four. And we're multiplying this by one, two on the right. Okay. And notice that what's going to happen is every time we do this multiplication, we're going to rotate that point one, two around by uh, 45 degrees or pi over four. So it rotates 45 degrees or pi over four counterclockwise uh, with each step. So let's see if we can understand this graphically. So our coordinate system here isn't normal x, y. This would be the coordinates like c1, the c1 coordinates that would be uh, in the direction of the 2, 1. And then here would be our c2 coordinates. Okay, so these guys are coming from the eigenvectors. But we're going to start right here at the point 1, 2. Right, this is at t equals 0. And then if you think about it, what's going on? We rotated 45 degrees, or pi over 4, counterclockwise. And then, so this would be at t equals 1. And then we're going to rotate. Maybe this time I'll write it as pi over 4, pi over 4 rotating 45 degrees each time. So here's t equals 2, t equals 3, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to rotate around this circle. There's no scaling that's happening yet, uh, but this is kind of where things are going. So next, we need to go back to the original coordinate system. So let me make sure you're tracking what's going on. So here in this first part, we started with our x naught. And then we found, uh, I guess it's PC inverse times X naught. And then in the second part, we found our rotation scaling matrix. Uh, it's not really C, it's the, but it's related to C. So it's like C times PC inverse times X naught, except for we have ignored the 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 r so it's actually technically this is one over r times uh times this because we wanted to uh, it so far we're just ignoring the scaling we're going to deal with the scaling last so here we are in step three and we want to go back to the original coordinates so return to original coordinates. So again, we started with x naught. We went to our new coordinate systems with our PC inverse. Then we did our C, except for we've ignored the scaling. So ignoring the scaling, um, we've already done that. Now we're going to go back to our original coordinates with our PC. So we ignore scaling. In order to ignore the scaling, we have this one over. That's what this is doing. So it'll come back in. Just hang tight. Just hang with me. So to do this, we have our P matrix or PC matrix, the 2, 1, minus 1, 0 times the cosine minus sine, sine, cosine, all at pi over four. Um, 
and but now we got to be careful we want to do this more than one time and you can see that what happens over time so it's not just at pi over four it's at pi over four times t so if we want to do this uh, once we would just go times pi over four. If we want to do it twice, we do pi over four times two, or pi over four times three, et cetera, et cetera. So times the one, two. So this is our uh, PC. This is our C. Here's our, oops. Here is our uh, X with respect to the C coordinates. All right, so we got to crunch it and think about what happens. Um, so this puts us back on, uh, we could multiply all this out if we wanted, but that's not uh, quite as important as understanding what's happening. So this changes the coordinate system back to some other set of coordinates. So, the, so we have uh, new coordinates. So, or maybe they're not new, they're new old coordinates. So these new old coordinates are, they're not square. They're not orthogonal to each other. And they're not the same length, same length. As in, you know, maybe we got, um, so we started with a circle and maybe it got longer one way and shorter the other. Ooh, sort of sounds like an ellipse. But they're also no longer, so it's no longer going to be perpendicular to each other. So we're actually going to end up with a cockeyed ellipse. So let's go look at the picture. So remember that the point one two in the uh, in the C one C two coordinates started with the point uh, zero one in the original x one x2 coordinates so we're so that point t1 or t sorry t equals zero is here t equals one is here t equals two is here t equals three t equals four so no long notice that it no longer looks like a straight uh 45 degree rotation because we took that original circle and we squashed it one way and stretched it out another. So we have this ellipse that's now cockeyed. So we managed to, to rotate um, rotate that ellipse, which is pretty cool. Like, think about it. You've been doing a math a long time. Have you ever seen an ellipse that wasn't in line with the standard X, Y coordinate systems? So just to be clear, you're understanding the punchline here in three, what this means is that uh, we are now on an elliptical path. So the last thing that we need to address here is we need to address that scaling factor. So the last really we're going to add or multiply back in the scaling factor. So we'll finally get our full-on formula where we had our original matrix A, which was equal to uh, P, C, P inverse, but we're writing it as uh, R, R times P and then we've got a rotation scaling matrix, C minus sine, sine, cosine, P inverse. Uh, so notice that here, this rotation scaling matrix plus the R combined to make that C, saying that same thing over and over again. And in our case, we have that our X of T, which is equal to, uh, a times x naught, but it's to the teeth power. That teeth power is really important. Will be equal to our r, which is square root of two, times uh, p, 
It's the two, one, minus one, zero. Here's our P matrix. And then here we'll actually write it all out. So we'll have cosine of pi over four, but it's pi over four T because we're doing the rotation T times. And then we have minus sine pi over four T. And we have sine pi over four T and cosine pi over four T. Then this is going to be times that inverse of P, which was, my gosh, I've lost track of it. Um, inverse is going to be the 0, 1, minus 1, 2. And then we have, so that's our, this is our P inverse. And then we have our 0, 1, which was our initial place. So that's our X naught. And these two combined are the, uh, what have we been using? Uh, one, two, which was our C coordinate of the initial state vector. Uh, notice that this square root of two in this matrix here, those are the guys that are combining to be our, uh, our C matrix, just like before. So graphically, what's going on is that we are starting here, again, at t equals 1, or sorry, t equals 0. And just like before, where we are rotating around that ellipse, but now we're including some scaling. And so every time we're actually moving farther and farther away, which is why it goes from t equals 0 to t equals 1, t equals 2 and 3 are here, t equals 4, t equals 5, t equals 6, t equals 7, t equals 8, t equals 9. So you can see how as soon as that r is bigger than 1, we're going to start spinning and things are going to get farther and farther apart. You almost have that uh, spiral galaxy type of, of look where things are going around in circles, but they're expanding out from whatever sort of explosion started those, uh, those galaxies in the, in the first place. So let me just go back over this question really quickly. So we're trying to do a dynamical system that and understand what the trajectories would look like with an initial state vector uh, and complex eigenvalues. So we started by finding the eigenvalues. Then we found the eigenvectors. Once we had our eigenvectors, we could do our factorization. And there was a formula that we needed to know in order to be able to do this factorization. So we ended up with our A equals the P, C, P inverse. And then we took the, the C and we broke it apart into a scaling factor and a rotation. And then the last thing we did was we sketched the trajectory. This was a little bit complicated, but we sort of built it up by starting with the initial state and writing it in terms of our C coordinates from the eigenvalues, or sorry, eigenvectors. And then we did our rotation. So we like changed the coordinates and then we turned it into a circle, figured out how far we're moving around the circle each time. And then we went back to the original coordinates, which put us on ellipse. And finally, we dealt with our scaling factor, which let us expand, in this case, because our R was bigger than 1, expand infinitely far of, uh, as t goes to infinity. And so altogether, these things, I hope, help you understand how we can use this concept of diagonalization or matrix factorization to uh, to explore what would be the long-term state of a dynamical system um, that we could describe using matrices.